If you've been following this series, you'll know I've been developing this autonomous boat, upgrading it in every episode, testing the changes, and discovering new problems that lead straight into the next one. For anyone new here, welcome. This is the journey of building a long-range depth mapping boat that can film and explore its surroundings in harsh conditions, completely on its own. In the last video, we upgraded the radio system, dropping to a lower frequency band to improve range and cut down on signal loss over water. It worked, but I wasn't happy with the antenna, and when we tested the fish finding depth mapper, the range was a disaster. We couldn't even map properly because the GPS inside the fish finder couldn't get a stable fix. In this video, we fix the antenna, we push the fish finder further, deal with major failure the night before test day, and try and get the boat working again, in time for its longest mission yet. We started by redesigning the new antenna to be printed with PTG rather than rubber, although being flexible was a nice idea to prevent it snapping. After two weeks of being printed, I could already see it starting to sag, leading to misaligning the antenna and causing potential signal issues. We begin the build by disassembling the old antenna system from the lid of the boat and gathering the components that were fitted. Mostly, we just needed the MLRS receiver back. It still folds down the same way, but this version is far more rigid and lets us use an SMA connection instead of wiring the antenna directly. That means we can swap and test different antennas at the end of the mast whenever we want. Most of the build goes together just like the previous one, adding the brass inserts, fitting the cable gland, and bolting on the mount. So this is my finder tool that works around the house. What I've got to do is put the antenna into the end of here. You probably won't ever be able to see, but there is a hex shaped hole on that side of the antenna end. Now because it's a tight fit and I don't want to damage the cable, my philosophy is use a metal straw. It goes right up to the metal so you don't damage the wire. You then can find where the hex fits, push it through like so, and then just feed it back off and tighten it up we then have our antenna end. Once the antenna was complete, we added a piece of heat shrink onto the tube and fed the antenna wire into the mast. The heat shrink is enough to hold the end on and allows us to remove it easily in case repairs are needed. Like so, we've then got our little bit of foam pad that I've made. Our black tuck done. We then add electrical tape to hold the lid before adding two cable ties to hold everything together. The gland can then be mounted onto the top of the lid as it will seal the serial cable into the boat. Everything gets tightened up before we wire the GPS and the radio receiver back into the flight controller, adding a little bit of hot glue to stop vibrations loosening the connections. We are now using an omnidirectional antenna, as this suits our boat a lot better than the VAS system we were using before. In total, the new mast stands at about 500mm above the top of the boat. The next upgrade was a buoyant donut for the fish finder that would be filled with a two-part foam. As I mentioned before, because I had the fish finder mounted on an arm, the ball sat lower in the water. With the internal GPS module and the Wi-Fi antenna sitting below the waterline, our range was guaranteed to be much shorter. The donut would allow for the fish finder to sit higher in the water, but would still have the bottom of it underneath. I designed the donut to fit our existing mount, but in the next iteration of upgrades for the boat, 
I plan on adding my own depth mapper that will relay the information over telemetry. The last upgrade is only small and simple, but crucial in long-range missions, a mount that holds the RC controller onto a tripod, allowing us to remove and mount the controller easily. As the controller will now be using a different antenna, which is a directional Voxon, will need to be aimed roughly in the direction of the boat, requiring us to ensure that the antenna itself also stays aimed correctly. We were also hoping that adding a spotlight would help the viewing range underwater. The night before test day, the flight controller suddenly stopped communicating on its serial ports. I discovered that this was most likely a corrupted parameter write. Simple to fix with a USB cable, but I didn't have the USB daughter board mounted or with me. With no other options, I butchered a USB cable and manually soldered the data wires to the flight controller's microscopic pins, my heart racing as we watched whether the laptop would see the board. We were very lucky and I quickly set the serial ports back up. Now we can't have that happen again and we'll have to change to a flight controller where the risk is greatly reduced as I can't have it happen when it's on the water. We're back at Thin Kellen to carry on testing the boat. We've got a few more upgrades that we've made and a disaster that's happened with the flight controller. So we'll be much more cautious in the beginning, but we'll see how it goes. As you can see behind me, the water is a lot higher than it was the last time we were here, and it is a lot more gloomy. That may improve the footage under the water. We'll have to see. Before setting the boat off, I wanted to make one last change, and that was tri-bladed props. Let me know in the comments which sound you prefer. <coughs> It's high pitch. <laughs> Interesting. Due to the major problems that we faced the night before with the flight controller, we started by simply setting the boat out in manual and ensuring that we wouldn't lose connection. In theory, this issue would only occur when writing parameters to the flight controller. We also needed to prove that our new antenna system would work at all. Once we were happy that the boat could be trusted again, we took out the fish finder and began sending the boat off to see if our donor had made an effect on the range. We immediately saw an improvement and easily gained about 50% more range before we lost connection. It's still shallow by the lake standards, but seeing 8.1 meters of water beneath the hull is still scary when you really think about it. Once the boat had lost connection, we concluded that the range had definitely improved, but was not at the standard that we wanted. As I mentioned before, we're going to add a sensor that we can take the data back over telemetry. We sent it back out with both the underwater camera and the new spotlight. In real terms, we could see roughly two meters away from the camera. We have two options moving on from this. We either ensure that the water that we're in is always clear, which is never going to happen, or we take the camera further below the surface, but that's an upgrade for another day but I'll let you keep in mind some of the ideas that I'm thinking of. It was time for the big test. Sending the boat out on almost a kilometer round trip, the boat began its journey quite oddly by turning too far in each direction a few times before working out which way it was actually meant to be facing. When the boat lost some parameters the night before, I did also have to recalibrate the AHRS and the GPS, so this may have something to do with it. This journey would be including the front facing camera and the underwater camera, so we're expecting to see some extra battery usage from the drag on the camera beneath the waterline. We also added a couple bike lights to the carbon fiber bars on the boat. This had two uses, finding the boat if we lose connection, and also being able to see which direction the boat was actually facing. 
so we could work out whether it was going away from us or coming back towards us. We had almost completed our full mission, but the boat started acting strangely on its last waypoint. It was at this moment I realised I hadn't set the last point to be a return to launch, which frustrated me so much at the time, but we had proved what we needed to at this stage, and we just had to ensure I don't make the same mistake again. I set the boat to return to launch on the controller, and we watch as it returns. We see the flashlight on the front of the boat in the distance, and it reminds us of what we've achieved so far. With the mission complete, the boat was back to safety, and since I already had my wellies on, I decided to try something I'd never tested before, a full stability test. I wanted to see how much force it would actually take to submerge and tip the holes, and honestly, I was surprised. It takes a lot more than I expected to flip the boat, which definitely makes me a lot more confident about future missions. I set the boat off again with the underwater camera and the fish finder on the back. I wanted to see what was underneath and whether we could get the depth mapper to actually map some depths. We started seeing more interesting things under the water, like this random stick that we almost hit and made me jump when I was reviewing the footage. We then managed to see some fish through the fish finder. We had some glitches but we kept a stable enough GPS fix the whole time and was able to achieve our first proper depth map using the boat. I just wanted to thank everyone for watching and a big thank you for getting me to a thousand subscribers. We have a long road ahead of us with projects and I'm looking forward to sharing every single one of them with you.